So good morning, good afternoon, bon dia, boa tarde uh, to all of uh, you joining us in this webinar on intergovernmental cooperation in multi-level systems organized by the Institute of Applied Economic Research and the Forum of Federations with the support of CEPAL ECLAC. Over the two days of the webinar, uh, we will um, aim to increase the understanding among Brazilian practitioners and researchers of intergovernmental collaboration in other jurisdictions to help inform the development of Brazil's own processes with a focus on public consortia. Experts from Switzerland, India, Argentina, Canada, South Africa, Germany, Mexico, and Colombia will share insights into the dynamics of the intergovernmental cooperation regimes within their respective countries. And we are very privileged to be joined today by an esteemed panel of experts from these eight countries. Uh, before we begin, um, let me give you a few uh, technical instructions to assure a smooth development of our webinar. Uh, when you are not speaking, we would kindly ask you to mute your, mi your microphones. When you participate in the discussion, and of, if possible, of course, please turn on your cameras, in particular for the question and answer period, so that you can ask questions directly to the panel. And also, just a note that the webinar is being recorded and following the event, the archived video will be posted on the websites of both the Forum of Federations and IPEA. And so without further delay, I, I would like to invite Rupak Chatopadia, President and CEO of the Forum of Federations, Carlos von Dollinger, President of the Institute of Applied Economic Research, and Ambassador Miguel Griesbach de Pereira Franco, Special Advisor of the Secretary of Government of the Presidency of Brazil and Forum of Federations Board Member for Brazil to say a few words to open proceedings. Rupak, please, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and to co-organize this event with IPEA. Uh, the Forum of Federations has a very long history uh, of working with IPEA at least 20 years uh, and, and being engaged with IPEA and its researchers working both on Brazil as well as on comparative issues. So in that, in that respect, it, it really is, uh, uh, is, is a pleasure for us to cooperate in organizing this, uh, this event with CEPAL and IPEA to talk about intergovernmental cooperation uh, around the world. Uh, this is a very important subject, particularly in the context of everything that's going on around the world in terms of managing the pandemic, where we realize uh, very quickly that it, uh, it is beyond the scope of any one order of government to manage uh, the outbreaks uh, uh, on their own. Uh, I, I, I know we have, uh, time is very limited, so I will um, end my brief welcome here by uh, also acknowledging uh, the role that uh, Fernando Rosende and Constantino Kornberger have played in putting this together. It's, it's a pleasure to meet virtually uh, Carlos von Dollinger, uh, as well as uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Frank, uh, Pereira Franco, uh, who will be joining this panel today. Thank you very much for taking the time to, to join us this morning. And I also want to thank our uh, moderator, Enid Slack, uh, who is going to moderate over the, over the two days of the conference. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, Sean Mueller, uh, Miguel Asensio, Jennifer Walner, uh, Rekha Saxena, uh, who joined us from uh, different parts of the world in different time zones. Uh, I look forward to the, uh, the uh, discussions today and tomorrow, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a very interactive session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rupak. Uh, Mr. Von Dollinger, please. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all the uh, specialists in our team, uh, in this uh, wonderful team, and uh, two days of discussion. Uh, okay, so uh, I have a lot to learn since uh, I'm not exactly a specialist in this team, but I expect to learn a lot from you and, and join the discussions. Uh, I, I, I hope this uh, will be very useful for 
for all of us. And the PEA is very happy to welcome, together with the, the team, we welcome this, uh, these discussions and uh, this opportunity to present the, the, uh, those issues. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope we will have a, a wonderful morning, two days of discussions. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for it. And I, I'm here uh, to learn. As I said, I'm here to learn a lot of it from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dollinger. And uh, I see Mr. Ambassador Miguel uh, Pereira Franco is with us. So um, welcome. And the floor is yours for the opening remark remarks. Well, good morning, Diana. Good morning, everybody. I just wanted to know if you are hearing me clear or if you are hearing me with echo, as I heard everybody that has spoken before me. Is everybody listening to me very well or with echo? Very well, very well. No echo. Very well. Well, so. Very well. Good morning to you all. On behalf of Minister Flavia Huda from the Secretariat of Government of the Presidency of the Republic, I would like to welcome the participants of this seminar on the theme of intergovernmental cooperation in multilevel systems. I will allow myself to read the speech because uh, she personally gave me some hints about the messages to be sent to you all in this first appearance of myself as director of the forum uh, from Brazil. Unfortunately, as you may be aware, she was unable to attend this event due to agenda issues, but she has instructed me to convey her congratulations to the Forum of the Federations for providing this exchange of experience and to IPEA for its willingness to present the Brazilian experience with public consortia. Regardless of the dimensions of the countries and the type of federalism in which they are organized, the notion of whole of government is an integral part of the, mentally, of the mentality of all managers performing activities at the federal, state, and municipal levels. Given the importance of the meeting, in the best possible way, the demands of the citizens for a whole and wide range of services, the modality of public consortium fully justifies the analysis by an institution such as the Forum of Federations. Today, I imagine that we are sure that this is another institutional arrangement in favor of coordination and cooperation between the different administ administrative spheres fully capable of improving budget execution, expanding the scope of projects, and reducing the perspective and respective costs of their implementation. In Brazil, the regulation of public consortia contained in the federal constitution of 1988 represented a response to the demand of federative entities, not only for intermunicipal coordination mechanisms, but also for budget execution instruments available to managers in 5,570 municipalities, 26 states, and in the federal district, as well as the executive branch in Brasilia. In this context, the enactment of law number 11,107 of April 6, 2005, the so-called Law on Public Consortia, regulated by decree number 6017 of January 7, 2007, which governs the Constitution of Consortia, has consolidated the basis for practical implementation of this instrument of federative cooperation. As of 2007, the same year, that decree of 6017 was published, 
the challenge of holding the Soccer World Cup in Brazil was presented when the commitment was the commitment was established to receive soccer teams and fans in 12 arenas and 12 host cities, many different. In practical terms, the condition of host country has represented a test for public consortia in several aspects. First, construction and renovation of stadiums. Second, urban mobility works. Third, expansion of airports. Fourth, security infrastructure, ports, telecommunications, and tourism. It is important to note that this accountability matrix was published on the Transparent Portal, a website maintained by the Federal Controller General, the so-called CGU, on the Internet. From this perspective of the Secretariat of Government, I think it is important at this time to highlight the fact that more than 3,100 Brazilian municipalities have already implemented some public policy in cooperation with other city halls through intermunicipal consortia as a way to avoid duplication of public policies and allow budget execution, the management of public, human, and logistical resources. In this context, it is possible to affirm that the formation of consortia is one of the characteristic features of the Brazilian federalism in its 21st century and to express the confidence of Minister Flavia Ruda that these two days of work will provide us with an exchange of experiences in the various segments related to management and the provision of services to improve the quality of life of populations. Our main objective as a government. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Ambassador uh, Branco, for his opening remarks. And uh, now let me, um, uh, we will proceed with um, um, our discussions. And uh, let me introduce uh, our moderator, Professor Init Slack, uh, who will actually guide us through the next uh, couple of hours. Init is uh, the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Manx School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Init has been working on municipal finance issues for for last 40 years and has been retained by agencies such as the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, International Growth Center, UN Habitat, Asian Development Bank and Inter-American Development, Development Bank in countries such as Brazil, China, Chile, Colombia, India, Mexico, Mongolia, the Philippines and South Africa. She has written several books and articles on property taxes, intergovernmental transfers, development charges, municipal infrastructure finance and metropolitan governance. In it, Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, with this, my work is done. And please, Init, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Diana, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's so great to see you all. And I'm delighted to be moderating today's webinar on intergovernmental cooperation in multi level systems. Um, we all know intergovernmental cooperation is important, but as Rupak pointed out, what really became obvious during the pandemic uh, that when governments work together at all levels, uh, things get done um, better and, and it was pretty important during the pandemic. Uh, today's webinar and tomorrow um, are designed to look at experiences in different countries. And today we're going to be looking at four countries, Switzerland, India, Argentina, and Canada. We're gonna see what works and what doesn't work, and most importantly, why they work or don't work. Our goal, as we heard already, is to help inform the development of intergovernmental processes in Brazil. But as you also heard from the ambassador, there are some pretty good intergovernmental processes in Brazil right now. Uh, public consortia are something that we write about quite a lot as a, as a very good model of how uh, municipal governments can work together. So let me just tell you how we're going to uh, spend the next couple of hours. We're first going to hear from two Brazilian experts about intergovernmental relations in Brazil. 
Uh, their presentations will be followed by a moderated discussion with four panelists. And to start, I'm going to ask each of the panelists two questions that they're going to respond to, and then we'll go into an open discussion with the audience where you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, we will, because it is a very long session, have a five minute break somewhere in the middle of the session. So um, I'm going to introduce our two Brazilian speakers first. Uh, they are Fernando Resende and Constantino Cronenberger. Uh, Fernando Resende is a consultant to private and public institutions in the area of public finance, tax reform, and fiscal federalism. He is a former president of the Institute of Applied Economic Research and professor of public finance and fiscal policy at the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Rio and Brasilia. He is an economist who holds a master's degree from Vanderbilt University. And I'm delighted to see Fernando because I haven't seen him for 10 years and it's nice to see him today. Our second Brazilian speaker will be Constantino Cronenberger Mendes, who's a researcher at the Institute of Applied Economic Research and director of the Forum of Federations Brazil office. He holds a doctorate in public sector economics from the University of Brasilia. If you want more information about our speakers, I believe you, you have their bios, so I don't want to take the time uh, to read them all out, so I'm just doing brief bios. So if I could, Fernando, turn it over to you. Thank you, Edith. It's a pleasure to see you again. I just want to stress two important aspects that, to my view, impinge on the proper work of intergovernmental relations in Brazil. The first is what I call the destruction of the fiscal equalization system one year after the enactment of the 1988 Constitution. At that time, and that is more than 30 years ago, the coefficients for transferring federal funds to states and municipalities were frozen. So, uh, what will happen nowadays is that we have a, a lot of in horizontal inequalities among the states and particularly among the municipalities. And uh, when I talk to that, I remember the theme of an important co conference in India, I guess in 2007 or something like that, more than 10 years ago, with the theme was unity and diversity. And I used to say that Brazil adopted uniformity in diversity, which is a very important and a very big problem for work. And, and the second point I'd like to make is uh, at the same time, uh, local government gain political autonomy. That is, they are not under the jurisdiction or the rules adopted by the states. To, uh, and, uh, political autonomy together with biennial elections. Yeah. In the middle of national elections for federal and state governments, there is local elections for the municipal government. So that is also a problem together with political fragmentation or representatives in the National Congress. There is also a big uh, problem to be, uh, for us uh, to, deal, to deal with in uh, trying to improve our intergovernment relations system. So uh, it's important for us uh, to, to collect experience from different countries in the world and try to see what uh, they tell us. Uh, I know that uh, we don't have a, a figurine that fits all in terms of uh, intergovernment relations in different parts of the world, but uh, it's very important to uh, learn how different countries dealt with the same problems that we face here in Brazil. And I hope to learn a lot from these uh, two days of discussion here in this webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fernando. And if I could um, I'd turn it over to Constantino now. Bom dia, obrigado. Eu vou falar na minha língua nativa, português. Espero que todos estejam me ouvindo bem. É, eu vou falar sobre consórcios públicos, um instrumento de cooperação federativa no Brasil. São é um projeto é, que está sendo levado em, com, em conjunto com a CEPAL, em apoio financeiro, apoio institucional do Fórum, 
é, cooperação intergovernamental na Federação Brasileira e políticas públicas. Antes, alguns agradecimentos com o embaixador Michel Gresbar, da Segov, representando o ministro Flávio Arruda, o Fórum das Federações, na figura do presidente Rupac, é, o IPEA, o presidente Von Dollinger, e todo o apoio dos diretores e do grupo de trabalho do projeto, palestrantes na figura da mediadora Emid Slack e a todos os presentes da plataforma. Eu inicio com os marcos legais que tratam do acompanhamento de responsabilidades, de recursos e ações públicas entre entes federativos na organização, no planejamento e na execução de políticas públicas de interesse coletivo. O embaixador já tocou no, na Emenda Constitucional 19, de 1998, o artigo 241 da Constituição Federal de 88, que prevê a gestão associada de serviços públicos. Isso foi regulamentado na Lei 11.107, de 6 de 4 de 2005, junto com o Decreto 6017, de 17 de janeiro de 2017, é a primeira lei exclusiva para a cooperação interfederativa por meio de consórcios públicos no Brasil. Porém, 50 textos legais, pelo menos, são identificados no âmbito federal, envolvendo aspectos jurídicos, de financiamento e de políticas públicas associados a consórcios públicos, por exemplo, os estatutos da metrópole, o Plano Nacional de Resíduos Sólidos, entre outros. Bom, as características dos consórcios envolve aspectos essenciais. Primeiro, político, trata de um acordo voluntário entre os entes federativos. Segundo, um aspecto institucional, porque eles integram a administração indireta dos governos consorciados. Ela é uma autarquia, né? o consórcio é uma autarquia. E um terceiro aspecto é o aspecto territorial no sentido de espaços integrados de ação pública e de serviços compartilhados, que isso reflete em impactos de desenvolvimento regional. O problema essencial aqui é que essa formalização legal, política dos consórcios, né, ele é uma pessoa jurídica, né, é, não assegura a durabilidade, a viabilidade e os resultados dos arranjos interfederativos. Uma questão crítica nesse tipo de análise é a exigência por um sistema de informações consistente, com o objetivo de avaliar os consórcios públicos como instrumento efetivo de articulação intergovernamental multinível, tendo em vista o federalismo específico brasileiro e as políticas públicas associadas. As fontes básicas principais de informações têm acesso público na, na internet, nos sites de cada instituição, mas cada uma elas possui características específicas, distintas e limitantes em termos de períodos de tempo, em termos de anos. A atualização, alguns são dinâmicas, anuais, quadrienais, é, o tipo de informante das informações, às vezes o município, às vezes o próprio consórcio, informações sobre o município sede, a identificação dos entes participantes, seja municípios, estados ou a União, e o setor de atuação de cada consórcio. Então, alguns exemplos. Né? O primeiro, a primeira fonte é o cadastro de pessoas jurídicas da Secretaria da Receita Federal. Nós temos um total de 3.446 registros com natureza jurídica compatível com os consórcios públicos, sendo que 1.911 são considerados consórcios ativos na, na última data de 2020. Destes, 661 atendem critérios específicos próprios de consórcios públicos. E aí, tanto a natureza jurídica, o Cadastro Nacional de, de, de Consórcio Público, e a razão social do consórcio. Né? É, a outra fonte são dados municipais da MUNIC, do IBGE, né? é, dos 5.570 municípios brasileiros, 75% dizem pertencer a consórcios públicos, sabendo que apenas um consórcio público é considerado formal pela União, que foi a Autoridade Pública Olímpica nas Olimpíadas de 2016. 
Ao mesmo tempo, a União só participa de consórcio público com a presença de Estados. Os 12 setores de atuação presentes nessa pesquisa, né, nessa plataforma, são saúde, educação, assistência e desenvolvimento social, turismo, cultura, habitação, meio ambiente, transporte, desenvolvimento urbano, saneamento básico, gestão de água e manejo de resíduos sólidos. O tratamento que a gente fez né, dentro do projeto dessas informações municipais, identificamos 1.262 consórcios públicos, em que é, os setores principais, com dados da última pesquisa de 2019, a maioria é na área de saúde, são 310 consórcios na área de saúde, 126 consórcios na área de resíduos sólidos e 99 múltiplos consórcios, né, aí envolvendo vários setores. A terceira plataforma é a plataforma Mais Brasil, que traz um sistema de convênios, que é um cadastro de convênios firmados entre os consórcios formalizados em termos de natureza jurídica e o governo federal, que seria uma amostra das bases das duas bases anteriores. Dos 195 consórcios cadastrados nesse sistema, 179 ou 92% deles, possui convênio com o governo federal. E 144, 144 ou 74%, tem pelo menos uma proposta apresentada ao governo federal para receber recursos públicos. É, dos 179 conveniados, consórcios conveniados, apenas 88% o 49% possui algum pagamento por serviço público executado com recursos do governo federal. Então, é, nesse sentido, é, esse acompanhamento do, da execução do recurso público federal, ele é dado por outro sistema do Tesouro Nacional, o CISCONF. Ela é uma base semelhante a essa anterior, e ela seria igual se todos os consórcios públicos cadastrados, eles conveniados, eles recebessem recursos da União. Então, um exemplo, é, tem um consórcio de desenvolvimento ambiental, ambiental sustentável em Minas Gerais, com oito municípios consorciados e conveniados com a União. É, por esse sistema, nós sabemos que 75% dos recursos federais executados pelo consórcio no período 2018-2020, estão concentrados em três municípios. É, ao mesmo tempo, é possível é, associar esses dados com um outro sistema, que é uma base do, do Tribunal Superior Eleitoral, em que nós entendemos os arranjos políticos dentro desse consórcio. E aí nós temos uma, uma, um olhar sobre a dinâmica política desse, desse determinado consórcio. Então, em síntese, é, a gente percebe que as relações entre essas bases ou fontes de informações, nós temos aí um total de 3.083 cadastros nacionais de pessoas jurídicas ou que seria consórcios públicos, sendo que 3.046 estão na base da Receita Federal, 1.262 estão na base do IBGE, na Munique, e apenas 336 estão na base do sistema de convênios federais, ou seja, dentro daquela base que provavelmente vai receber recursos públicos do governo federal. No final, cruzando todas essas bases, apenas 291 consórcios estão nas várias bases, simultaneamente, ou seja, uma amostra razoavelmente pequena de análise, né? consistente, digamos assim. Então, em função disso, algumas conclusões eu retiro dessa minha apresentação. A primeira é a diversidade de fontes de informações, revelando inconsistências internas e incompatibilidades entre elas, decorrentes de características próprias e objetivos específicos. De um lado, isso limita a análise, o acompanhamento e a avaliação dos consórcios, mas de outro, demonstra a importância do projeto que nós estamos envolvidos, de compatibilização das fontes em andamento, inclusive com uma nota técnica sendo concluída. 
Uma segunda conclusão é que uma chave de integração. And the, another conclusion is that uh, an integration of the database. The one key factor is the Receita Federal Brazilian Internal Revenue Registry that can use other attributes and other characteristics of the public consortium. A third conclusion we can draw is that we have specificities in the Brazilian Federation that are, are very clear. The issue of the autonomy of the municipality that reflects on the public consortium, the political relations between the entities uh, which are co -op uh, cooperatives and sometimes they compete, and we have uh, many political arrangements that are unstable and a lot of legal insecurity and uh, that might have negative effects on public uh, private partnerships as well a fourth conclusion is that we still have roles from the federal and the state government with a few exceptions in trying to encourage the creation of consortia in the country in sharing the responsibilities and sharing the resources and in setting the goals and targets for public service. A fifth conclusion we can draw is that we realize the potential of the consortia as an instrument of cooperation in between the, legal, the federal entities and providing pub, uh, public services, uh, scaling up the and reducing the cost of the, provide, the provision of service and also sharing the services in the structure between the cooperated entities. And finally, we understand the importance to compare this national experience of this instrument with similar instruments or alternatives of inter uh, for other cooperation tools for a more effective cooperation between the federal entities. Thank you very much, and I'm here at available for further information. Great, thank you very much, Constantino. That was a, a very comprehensive review of public consortia in Brazil. Um, uh, I'm fascinated that there are over 3,000 of them, um, and, and your conclusions are very interesting, and I'm not going to repeat them, but um, one of the things we'll be talking about later this morning is how do you evaluate these consortia or intergovernmental cooperation agreements, and you've talked about databases, but databases that don't talk to each other uh, and, and don't relate to other forms of data that we would use for evaluation, and so we'll come back to that. And, and, but you ended by talking about the, the importance of looking at what other places are doing, and that's what we're going to turn to now, keeping in mind uh, what Fernando said, which was, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all. We can look at other countries, see what works, see what didn't try to understand the reasons, uh, but of course everything has to be taken into the context of, of uh, in your case, Brazil. So with that, we're going to turn to our panel, and we have uh, a lot of experience on this panel from four different countries. Again, I'm going to introduce everybody, um, but their bios are available to you, so I don't want to take time uh, going through their bios. Uh, the first is Sean Muller, who's an assistant professor of political science at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, Rekha Saxena, who's a professor of political science at the University of Delhi in India. Miguel Angel Asensio is a professor of public finance, fiscal policy and public par uh, administration paradigms at the Universitat Nacional del Litoral in Argentina. And lastly, Jennifer Walner, who's an associate professor of political science at the University of Ottawa in Canada. So we're looking at Switzerland, India, Argentina, and Canada today. And um, I'm gonna start by asking uh, everyone on the panel a question. Um, and, and I'm gonna give you each about five minutes to answer so that we have time to hear from everybody and, and also have some discussion later. And the question is this, if you could tell us what are the key aspects that affect either positively or negatively, the actual working of the intergovernmental regime in your country. And by key aspects, we're looking at the institutional background, the political arrangements, operational mechanisms. What, what are the things uh, that affect the working of your intergovernmental regime in your country? And I'm going to start with Sean, if I could. 
Thanks, Enid, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I start with the, uh, talking about Switzerland, maybe it should be recalled that um, when we talk about Switzerland, people usually think of the federal level, um, federal Switzerland. But if you look at the finances, two thirds of all public finances are generated and spent at the subnational level by the municipalities. There are around 2,000 municipalities overall in whole of Switzerland and by the 26 canton. So actually, much more is going on at the subnational level than at the federal level. And that's already a key aspect that facilitates, but at the same time obstructs uh, intergovernmental cooperation because it facilitates it because each canton or each region, each constituent union is responsible for managing its own affairs in a both, both efficient, uh, efficient and legitimate way. So each canton has to seek the kind of cooperation that it thinks helps it uh, deliver the services for its citizens. So that's an encouragement to seek efficient cooperation. But at the same time, obviously, the wealth is not distributed equally um, across the entire territory. So regions that are more prosperous because they have large cities, um, service industry, or are uh, ideally located near the, the airport, for them, it's much, much easier to cooperate with neighboring regions because if uh, things don't advance, well, they can just foot the bill and pay the remaining 10% and it's not even going to show up in the cantonal budget. Whereas the poorer regions um, have much more difficulty uh, engaging in that kind of cooperation because every dollar, every Swiss franc counts and it's very difficult for them to engage in, in kind of luxurious inter-cantonal or inter local cooperation. So they'll stick to the basics. So you have a huge variety also in the kind of uh, cooperation agreements that are struck both between the cantons and between the municipalities. Richer areas can afford to invest a bit more and have also kind of uh, nice to have uh, services such as a uh, common IT center in, in central Switzerland. So the, the, the whole IT department is pooled by a couple of cantons. Um, whereas the poorer areas, they just have to look that they can organize the basics, which is uh, clean water, water provision, electricity, managing the electricity grid, and of course, the local roads. So the autonomy that the subnational has, fiscal and policy autonomy, helps cooperation. But at the same time, it's also a key obstacle because it depends where you look uh, and you will find different degrees and intensities of cooperation taking place in the different parts of the country. Okay, thank you. So that, that's really interesting. I love the term uh, luxurious cooperation. <laughs> you know, some people can afford to cooperate and others can't. And it, it'd also be interesting to hear more later about, it would seem the poor municipalities would want more cooperation, they would need more help, whereas the richer ones would rather go it alone. But you're actually suggesting that the richer ones can take a chance on cooperation. If it doesn't work, um, they'll figure it out on their own. So very interesting. So but your, your main point is autonomy is what affects cooperation. Uh, Rekha, can we turn to India? Yeah, good morning, everyone. I think I'm audible now. Yes, you are. Thank you. So thank you so much um, to thank Forum of Federation and IPA for uh, this kind of invitation. And I think like my co-panelists mentioned, there are some key aspects that positively or negatively, you know, affect the working of intergovernmental relations in any federal country with some variations rooted in historical or cultural context. And this also applies to my country, India. And in my opinion, I think the nature of the constitution is very important. And if separation of powers is incorporated in the written constitution, and there are some kind of checks and balances, I think uh, there'll be no centralization or decentralization, rather there'll be constitutional balance in the conduct of intergovernmental relations. So written constitution, I think, uh, which is there in almost all federation, I think, uh, which, is, uh, which becomes a kind of summon bonum of federalism. So if constitution is established, constitutional norms and values are followed, I think it will have positive uh, results and uh, uh, balance in intergovernmental relations. And if they're undermined, uh, like uh, I think it will have negative impact. 
and in india uh, it's uh, the distribution of powers is given in the seventh schedule of the constitution itself and we have an independent judiciary you know that can uh, look into uh, the conflicts between the two tiers of the government now another factor i think is the nature of the government that plays a very important role and in parliamentary federations generally you know they have stronger executives than presidential congressional regimes and also the upper house uh, uh, is weak you know because government remains in office as long as it enjoys majority in the lower house so the typical pattern of intergovernmental relations is executive federalism and this is the case in india as well uh, though the upper house uh, is a federal house but uh, it is uh, but i think legislative federalism is a weak link in intergovernmental relations in india uh then i think another important aspect is party system party system which plays a very critical role and uh, if party system uh, is highly centralized like dominance of you know communist party even uh, though 1936 soviet constitution had decentralized states by giving power to secede then also there was centralization so similarly in india uh, when we had one party dominance of the congress party the parliamentary features overshadowed mm -hmm. federal features so even intergovernmental relations they were more centralized uh, but when uh, you know india moved from one party dominance to multi party system since 1989 the federal features became more prominent and then interstate council which is the apex intergovernmental forum was constituted which is a constitutional body but it has not been a very active body uh, then as i mentioned earlier independent judiciary that is a very important factor Uh, but uh, in indian case it's a mixed experience and it will depend on whether the courts are unitarist or federalist like uh, one in one party dominant phase when indira gandhi was the prime minister she had imposed emergencies so there was centralization and she has suppressed all democratic institutions but in multi party coalition phase the judiciary did play a proactive role and we saw the famous sr bome judgment giving other judgments in favor of the states so uh, and even in the present time when we have one party majority government uh, the though uh, some of the chief justices they you know uh, were uh, gave more centralized judgments but the present chief justice ramanna he is more autonomous and even with regard to dealing of covid under the disaster management act he ordered the government to give compensation to affected states and section of the population and lastly i think is uh, the liberalization privatization and globalization since 1990s that has brought a sea change in economic policy regime and several independent regulatory authorities have been set up besides the judiciary with semi uh, judicial nature like the uh, telecom regulatory authority national human rights commission minorities commission central vigilance commission lokpal institutions etc so there has been a shift you know from nehruvian socialism to globalization and uh, so decentralization forces were also so reinforced the constitution which separates the power whether it's the liberalism party system an independent judiciary and you finished with privatization liberalization and globalization so really kind of the context of the whole country you're in and how that allows governments to work together um i'm going to turn now to argentina to miguel angel assetsi okay uh, good morning to all of yours it's a big pressure to share this conversation with uh, so a marvelous people with people from brazil i beg your pardon for not speaking <laughs> in portuguese uh, brazilian people also speaks <laughs> an excellent portuguese and <laughs> as in argentina understand perfectly portuguese but <laughs> my personal portuguese is very very bad and so i will uh, speak in english uh, i i will begin a uh, with a uh, two quotation one from uh, richard bird uh, from the university of toronto in canada which speaks about the importance of the process of federalism rather than its product it's very interesting this uh, uh, remembering from richard the process in federalism so 
if we are speaking about cooperation, we are speaking about the process of uh, one uh, uh, multi-level system. So I, I want to quote also to George Anderson, the former president of the Forum of Federation, when he remembers us that heads of government, ministers can dominate. Legislatures can play an important role. Party regime is critical and the central government can be coercive. This is an important point that I want to uh, remember here. Uh, in Argentina, the federation includes 23 provinces, the autonomous city of Buenos Aires, uh, 2,200 municipalities, and of course the national government. Uh, the scheme, of course, rests in the uh, national constitution, which last reform was in 1994. Uh, in my personal opinion, uh, thinking about the key aspects that affect the multi-level cooperation, uh, at present, the political divide is a serious uh, challenge for this uh, um, positive cooperation in Argentina at present days. So, in general, the cooperation continues uh, in spite of some pitfalls like the uh, uh, COVID-19 shows. It was uh, uh, very interesting and uh, uh, also difficult uh, experience uh, around the world and also particularly in Argentina. The revenue sharing system, speaking about fiscal issues, is a, a central point in the relations uh, among the federation and provinces and uh, the uh, requirement of the last reform in the constitution imposes the uh, uh, leveling the uh, big inequalities uh, among the horizontal uh, scenario which present different provinces. Of course, in the Pampian region, uh, in front of the uh, uh, Northwest, for example, uh, uh, recently, some conflicts in the uh, fiscal arena were solved by the Supreme Court, which is not the best scenario. But the conflict, the conflicts about fiscal issues exist, and the Supreme Court, uh, it's possible to imagine, will continue intervening in this field. Uh, in relation with the, the working of the cooperation, the last reform in the constitution introduced three main reforms. One was the uh, 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 creation of the autonomy for the uh, city of Buenos Aires. Now Buenos Aires is the autonomous city of Buenos Aires with a constitutional personality. In the other way, uh, the constitution establishes the autonomy for the municipalities because in our system municipalities in the origin were uh, uh, like in uh, United States or Canada are creatures of the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, provincial governments. The relation was uh, between the federal government and provincial government. Now with the autonomy, which is necessary to uh, include uh, in the provincial constitutions, the municipalities has much uh, importance and power. And then the, uh, um, the other, um, the other um, uh, important point in the uh, uh, cooperation scenario is the creation of the, uh, in the horizontal level of the uh, regions. Uh, among provinces or between provinces, it is possible to create regions. So, the cooperation in this moment must uh, be uh, developed uh, considering this uh, new, uh, this renewed scenario. Uh, some regions have, created, uh, have been created, New Cujo, for example, Central Region, Patagonia Region, all of them 
have in this moment uh, uh, very interesting uh, powers in relation to economic development and uh, progress in a, in a fashion not imagined uh, years ago. Uh, usually the management of river basins offers some problems. For example, Quinto River, um, Salado River between Santa Fe and Santiago del Estero, and Rio Grande River between Mendoza and Rio Negro, etc. Well, I prefer to uh, reserve myself for the uh, next question, uh, keeping the time asked for the organizer. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Miguel. And, and you have also raised the issue of autonomy, as Sean did, um, with municipalities in Argentina getting more autonomy over time. And the creation of the regions is also very interesting because that implies some cooperation among municipalities in the region. And um, so, so that's a, a very interesting development as well. Uh, lastly, to Canada, Jennifer. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you again to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this. It's uh, really wonderful, actually, to hear such great descriptions of intergovernmental affairs in a uh, multiplicity of federations, where you really do see you know, my, uh, I worked under Richard Simeon as my supervisor, and uh, he always said that all federations are highly sui generis, right, to use the Latin phrasing, uh, and the idiosyncrasies uh, really do abound. But that said that there, there are interesting consistencies and parallels. And so, Sean, for instance, when you started to speak of the significance of the autonomy of the regions and decentralized fiscal federalism, that certainly resonates quite strongly here in Canada as well. And I wanted to start just by painting a brief picture of some of the main features of intergovernmental relations in Canada. Uh, they are quite varied, in fact, um, but all share the consistent feature of uh, extensive secrecy and largely more reactive than proactive. They are dominated much like in India as a parliamentary federation by the political executive and senior officials. Uh, traditionally, the deputy ministers, who are the official senior public servants um, and the heads of the respective ministries. But increasingly, in the past, I would say, 15 or so years, you've been seeing the rise of political staffers um, playing a more and more uh, uh, prominent role in the intergovernmental landscape in the country. Uh, the high profile kind of apex is the first minister's meetings. Uh, which are uh, the Prime Minister and the Premiers of the provinces and territories. Uh, but these are extremely ad hoc uh, because they are called at the pleasure of the Prime Minister. And so we have seen, depending on, uh, in Canada, basically it's been his, so I'll use that pronoun, um, depending on the personality and the outlook of the Prime Minister that's in power, this really shapes and influences the nature of the dynamics between the federal government and the provinces and territories. So for instance, under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, um, he did not, uh, 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 he did not see the value, let's say, of uh, actively engaging uh, in a consistent and concerted fashion with the premiers. Uh, he, in uh, the span of time that he was Prime Minister of the country, uh, which is about 10 years, uh, only two such meetings were called, if memory serves, and both of these were under quite significant duress, specifically uh, the global financial meltdown, um, and that is what inspired him to call these meetings, otherwise he really had no interest in them. Uh, under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, First Minister's meetings have occurred at least once a year, and during the pandemic, um, uh, the Prime Minister and the Premiers have been meeting through teleconferences with remarkable regularity. The workhorse, though, of intergovernmental relations in Canada are the permanent sector level intergovernmental tables who grind out regular activity to try and align practices and manage interdependencies. And this work in these sector level tables, so here I'm speaking of the Ministers of Labor, the Ministers of Environment, the Ministers of Health, uh, this kind of transcends the individual personalities of the Prime Minister and the Premiers, but still occurs behind closed doors with little fanfare or public engagement. Uh, and so here, you know, listening to the experiences in Brazil, which where you have far more institutionalized structures, again, these are very ad hoc, uh, even though they 
they have a permanent sort of existence. There's no online portal, for instance, that citizens can go and look at to track uh, to see if any sort of actual meaningful advancements have been made on certain things. And when I say that they're reactive, uh, to give a case in point, uh, one of the things that mobilized the ministers of labor was an ice storm in Quebec, where in order to deal with uh, repairing hydro lines, they needed to be able to bring in work crews from different provinces. Unfortunately, though, many of the crews couldn't go work in the province, in the specific province, because their safety gear wasn't to code in that province. And so this inspired a whole creation of an internal portal among the provinces to try and align their, their codes, right? This is like, it's such a practical issue. Uh, and so this is what, um, this is what drove that. So uh, before I close my comments on this opening question, I just wanted to highlight what I think are some key attributes that shape IGR. Um, definitely the fact that we are a parliamentary federation. Uh, this has tra translated into a very executive dominant system. We have uh, very weakly in, uh, integrated political parties. And I would say, much like many of the things that we hear about, sometimes this helps Canada's intergovernmental affairs, and sometimes this hinders Canada's intergovernmental affairs. We also are a multinational federation where we have um, uh, the Francophone population of Quebec and the Quebecois, which are identified now as an internal nation within Canada um, that operates alongside of uh, the rest of Canada, it's colloquially known, uh, even though that has no real meaning um, uh, beyond what we like to pretend it has meaning for. Uh, also, much like uh, what Sean and others have been uh, discussing, there's a high influence of regionalism and significant variations in the economic profiles of the provinces and their relative economic clout. This is further compounded by the fact that natural resources are controlled at the subnational level. Uh, and so resource rich Alberta has experienced very significant uh, fluctuations in their economic clout due to the uh, uh, rise and fall of oil prices. Uh, and so those are kind of my opening thoughts on uh, the various features. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, and you've, you've raised some of the same points as others have raised. Um, uh, I guess the multinational system is a little bit new, perhaps, but uh, being a parliamentary federation and executive dominance, uh, regionalism. Uh, I, I would just add, if I might, because I am in Canada and I do have my pet peeves as well. And when Jennifer talked about these intergovernmental tables, she talked about federal provincial tables. She never talked about municipal. And the reason is that the municipalities aren't at the table. And some of us think they maybe should be at the table. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, municipalities were talking to the federal government uh, not just through provinces, but directly. And, and some people are thinking, well, is, is there something new? Is there a model here uh, in, in, that we could use following the pandemic? So um, I've been asked to, to give us a five minute break so everybody can uh, grab something to drink. When we come back, and, and it really will be five minutes, I'm going to be very strict because we've got lots more to do. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists about the role that the central and provincial state governments play in the intergovernmental cooperation regime. So uh, five minutes, um, I've got 9.06, so 9.11, uh, we'll come back uh, and continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I think we're going to start back. Um, I, I, I said I was gonna stick to a fairly strict five minute break. So, um, the second question, uh, as I said, is, is about the role. What is the role played by the central and provincial or state governments in the intergovernmental cooperation regime? And he, here we're sort of interested in, you know, is it a top-down uh, kind of approach where the federal or provincial state government says, you know, you have to do it this way or we're going to create these cooperation mechanisms? Or is it bottom-up? where the, the local governments come together and say, we want to cooperate, this is in our interest, um, or, or is it a bit of both, as, as we often see in some countries? So, uh, Sean, I'm going to turn to you first to answer this question about the role of the federal and provincial or state governments. 
Well, you ask me if it's bottom up or, or top down, and I would say in Switzerland, it's not even bottom up, it's just bottom. It just remains at the bottom, nothing goes up, everything stays at the bottom. So the municipalities, they cooperate with each other if they really have to. If they can avoid it, they will not cooperate even with each other. Uh, same for the cantons. So the cooperation is as much an evil as a good for, for a cantonal autonomy, because once you engage in a cooperation agreement, you are bound by the decisions of somebody else, your partner. It's like marriage. You cannot just run your own show anymore. So it gets a little bit more complex. So if possible, municipalities and, and cantons do it on their own. But if they decide to cooperate, then uh, the last thing that the higher level would uh, want or would contemplate is to get involved in what the lower level does. The higher level, the federal government vis-a-vis the cantonal corporation and the cantonal government vis-a-vis the local corporation in their canton, the last thing they want is to be bothered by knowing what's going on, by having to send people to control what's going on, least of all register and develop a database and keeping track of who is doing what. That's not the task. That's not how the task of the upper level is perceived to be. The task of the upper level is perceived to, to jump in when and only when the lower levels cannot do it on their own anymore. So this notion of subsidiarity, which it's a fluid thing, much like the multinational society that Jennifer mentioned in the Canadian case, everybody agrees that we want to uphold and and value and exercise subsidiarity. Um, Basically, it means that the lower levels do as much as they can on their own, and the higher level does not want to get involved. It's also facilitated by the fact that Switzerland is very small. Um, Yes, there are different languages, but it's a fairly homogeneous society. And the French speakers do not consider them to be a distinct nation of any sort. Um, They are Swiss, even more so than the the majority, uh, the German speakers and the Italian speakers. They are the most Swiss of them all. So that helps the cooperation. And there is a trust there. Uh, Some people would also say it's a certain indifference. Um, So tolerance, indifference. If in the East they want to cooperate, let them do it as long as we don't have to be involved and pay for their cooperation regime. Okay, so you're sticking with your theme of autonomy and subsidiarity uh, in in your second question uh, as in your first. So the federal government doesn't want to be involved. Um, And it sounds like even the cantons and uh, municipalities aren't that keen on cooperating and only do so if they have to. Okay, Rekha, what about in India? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. I think first and the second questions in my view are interrelated and uh, the role played by center and provinces in intergovernmental cooperation has been guided by the context and the uh, actors that I mentioned earlier. And uh, like we have written constitution and clear cut demarcation of jurisdiction. But there have been phases of cooperation and confrontation between the center and the states. And especially party system has played a very crucial role when we have one party dominance of the Congress, uh, same party was ruling at the center and in most of the states. So India was described as was I federal because uh, center dominated everything. And therefore intergovernmental relations, they were also centralized. They were more informal. The only constitutional mechanism interstate council uh, was not set up until 1990. And uh, there was another mechanism, National Development Council, which was set up, but not under the constitution, but by cabinet resolution. So uh, it was more uh, top down approach. There were more informal uh, consultation and Congress party, uh, since it was there at uh, power in at the center and in most of the states, uh, most of the intergovernmental consultation was done through party forums like uh, Congress Parliamentary Board, uh, Congress Working Committee, and uh, Prime Minister Nehru, he used to write fortnightly letters to chief ministers to elicit their opinion on different policy issues. And then uh, more ad hoc meetings of ministers, deputy ministers. But as Jennifer mentioned, it has been more closed door. 
I did a case. Uh, my PhD was on intergovernmental relations in India and Canada, and I did a study of first ministers' conferences. So it was more elitist in nature. Same here, you know that eleven men in suits decide for the country. Here also, it has been more centralized, more closed door, more elitist in nature, and uh, centre did dominate legislative, administrative, financial relations, and uh, uh, so it were. Uh, but then I think with the, the transformation of party system. to multi party systems in 1989 states have, the focus has shifted from center to the states they have become the new la laboratories and uh, you know and there were some commissions uh, sarkariya commission which was set up uh, when congress party was ruling in 1983 to look into center state relations and then uh, prime minister rajiv gandhi signed some peace accords with uh, you know states like assam and punjab uh, but both of them backfired and then uh, uh in multi party coalition phase also you know this uh, another commission was set up on center state relations panchi commission i was also member of one of the task forces and then national commission to review the working of the constitution which uh, talked about you know uh, strengthening cooperative federalism and strengthening the institutions of you know cooperative federalism in the true spirit of federalism and uh, since uh, 2014 we are having one party majority government so but some important uh, structural reforms have taken place uh, the planning commission has been replaced by niti ayog and its governing council because one of the criticisms of the planning commission was that it was set too centralized so instead the, so there was uh, debate regarding federalizing the planning commission so instead of center appointing the members of planning commission state center and state should jointly appoint the members of the planning commission so this governing council of the niti ayog you know it has been it has met almost six times since uh, you know it was uh, constituted in 2015 and then we changed from uh, value added tax uh, there was major structural reform in taxation system from value added tax to goods and services tax and uh, it uh, all, the government also set up this uh, gst council goods and services uh, tax council you know which was set up by the president and 43 meetings of the council have you know taken place so far um, till 2020 so center states have jointly uh, more recently i would say they have more joined uh, they have played uh, a very crucial role especially during the pandemic and india's response to pandemic has been largely that of close cooperation and coordination between the two levels of the governments and it has been a very good example of executive federalism where prime minister through video conferences with chief ministers you know discussed uh, the different issues so there have been but there have been instances of confrontation between the two with regard to other issues like implementation of uh, implementation of central laws in form of and uh, lockdown quarantine inadequate relief for poor migrants especially um, you know women so in conclusion i would say notwithstanding the uh, limitations in intergovernmental relations india has evolved over the years and uh, rather it is still in the process of evolving <laughs> so but it has been more informal and more vertical than horizontal i in uh, switzerland my colleague talked about this uh, local level but in india it's it's still evolving at the at vertical level at the state level so uh, i can't talk about local think of local level because it got constitutional footing only after since the 74th constitutional amendments in 1990s but uh, so it has been more vertical than horizontal so thank you so much Okay well thank you very much so that is a different uh, case study than Switzerland where this is much more top down um but increasingly there's cooperation between the central government and the state governments I I I am interested in local governments but I um we'll we'll come back to that if we can later uh Miguel can you talk about Argentina Well uh and in respect to with the uh, Argentina the, the role of the central government is really central so the the main actor in the uh, regime in the uh, in the in the in the middle of the problems <laughs> is also uh, the central government and um, accepting in this um, in this game accepting the exclusive horizontal arrangement so you have of course vertical and horizontal arrangements in the in the system of uh, of the constitution but uh, excluding the uh, um, horizontal treaties for example 
uh, with the uh, Article 125 of the Constitution, also the, the central government plays a role uh, particularly important. In Argentina, uh, doesn't exist some experience like the Canadian uh, Council of Governments. That is to say, a meeting of uh, the main authorities of the provinces. Uh, uh, or like the uh, Australian Council of Governments. In Argentina, the, the governors uh, uh, have meetings in, in some uh, issues or in some matters, but not regularly, not in a, in a, in a council, in an organization with joint uh, all the governments uh, regularly. Uh, so, not only the formal, but mainly the informal relations are the, predo the predominant uh, uh, style for uh, uh, connecting, for example, in the horizontal level, governors, or also in the vertical level, the federal government with the governors. It's uh, a very uh, important in our case. The party regime is also very important because uh, now we have national parties, like, of course, like in other federations, and uh, where you have a national party, usually the national representatives connect with the regional representative of the same party, and then the cooperation operates mainly with an agreement inside the, the party, and then with the other party. And when you have national parties, the, the predominance of the uh, decisions or the agreement among parties prevails uh, in, um, in the operation of the system uh, over the territorial agreements. The territorial agreement arrives after the party agreement. Um, one aspect uh, very important in the last year, uh, in the last years, is the uh, uh, particular uh, system of transfers uh, called the ATM. Like, that is to say, uh, transfer from the national treasury to the provinces. And in this way, usually, um, uh, uh, presidents coming from one province have increased the transfer to some particular province. So it is uh, uh, an aspect which uh, uh, not gives uh, clarity to the uh, fiscal issue of equality uh, in the uh, fiscal federalist system in Argentina. The um, institution uh, more uh, known uh, for the operation of, of cooperation uh, uh, among municipalities or among uh, uh, the federal governments and provincial governments are the federal councils. The federal councils are institutions which meet, for example, for particular issues like education, like health. For education is the uh, uh, COFESA, for health is COFEMA, for uh, environment is a federal council also. And in the federal councils, the data, mainly the data and the uh, uh, connecting and coordinating role is in charge of the uh, federal ministers. So with the presence of federal ministers, the federal councils also recognizes the uh, preeminence of the federal government. Okay, thank you very much. So you're saying um, it, it's a, there are horizontal arrangements. They're fairly informal. There's no formal meeting of provinces, but then you did talk about these um, federal councils on specific issues like education or health, uh, but again, the federal government taking the central role uh, in, in making these work and collecting the data, etc. Okay, uh, to Canada. Great, thank you, Enid. And yes, this is actually where I get to speak about the absence of municipalities uh, in the intergovernmental landscape in Canada. And so if we're thinking are the dynamics top down or bottom up? It is definitely not an or situation. It is definitely 
you see patterns of both at work uh, at different points in time and sometimes simultaneously. So certainly from the public's perspective, it is the federal government based in Ottawa that kind of drives the intergovernmental cooperation bus, if we should refer to it as that. Uh, it is the federal government who has the largest amount of fiscal resources at its disposal. And so the provinces, when they want to engage in new public programs, uh, sorry, uh, so the federal government has the lion's share of the finances, but the provinces have, of course, the lion's share of jurisdiction and power. So it is the provinces that are in control of healthcare, education, um, child care, like all of these sort of big ticket government driven items, that's where, that's where the power resides. And so what you end up seeing is when uh, there is a federal government in power that has an interest or aspirations in trying to expand social programs or deal with the environment, then you see a heightened degree of intergovernmental, meaning vertical, uh, federal, provincial engagement. When you have a federal government that is not so, uh, uh, doesn't have that as such a high priority, you see a reduction in the sort of high profile vertical intergovernmental activity. In the meantime, though, as Miguel mentioned, the provinces, in fact, have always been uh, one of the drivers of cooperation. So it's the provinces, in fact, who started back in the late 18 uh, in the late 1800s the tradition of meeting. Uh, and so it was because of their inspiration and motivation that the federal government started to try and do this as well and engage in this sort of cooperation dynamic. The provinces though are not always very consistent in their cooperative endeavors. And again, it varies uh, depending on the relations between the premiers uh, so you see a greater degree of horizontal cooperation and engagement among the Atlantic provinces, which are traditionally the economically weaker provinces. And, uh, and now we see rising patterns. So for instance, Quebec and Ontario started to hold joint cabinet meetings uh, when their two provinces were governed by liberal um, uh, premiers. But that again, now, now that we have two conservative sort of premiers in here, we see less of this sort of engagement and activity. So once again, we see this pattern of kind of ad hoc uh, and quite varied engagement, depending on the individual personalities of premiers and leaders and the particular issues of the day. The two, uh, oh, I should, uh, I also wanted to uh, draw attention to um, two specific features. One is that Provincial legislatures are essentially sidelined from any sort of intergovernmental engagement. Uh, the same goes for the federal parliament, right? Again, we're, we're still at the sort of executive centered uh, nature of the dynamics. And so as a result, any sort of uh, engagement with stakeholders, so again, if, we're, if we're thinking of bottom up, any engagement with stakeholders and citizens happens within each province and territory who then represents and speaks on behalf of their jurisdiction when they meet either horizontally or vertically. Uh, the other aspect uh, and attribute here is, is that Canada does have, of course, three territories in the north, which were traditionally under the control of the federal government. However, through processes of devolution launched in the 1990s, the territorial governments have gained greater control and autonomy, securing representation in the intergovernmental arena. But this representation is highly contested, particularly by the province of Quebec, who holds that territories are not constitutionalized in the Federation and therefore should not have a formal seat at the IGR table. Which leads me now, of course, to the uh, issue of municipalities, which are also uh, predominantly sidelined from uh, formal representation in intergovernmental tables. The pandemic has shifted this a little bit, uh, and thanks to the uh, ongoing efforts of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the uh, federal government has started to re-engage directly with municipalities, but for the most part, again, this is quite contested, and the provinces say, nope, you cannot speak to our municipalities. 
you need to speak through through us as provinces because these municipalities are creatures of our jurisdiction. So this is again a, 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 huge, a quite a significant issue. In fact, as we're trying to um, improve the lives of our citizens, the last issue here that I would just like to bring up is uh, there is a very significant question about the representation of Indigenous nations uh, and Indigenous peoples in intergovernmental relations. And again, here we see uh, uh, ongoing, as um, Rika was just mentioning, this is quite an evolving issue. Um, and so, for instance, in our main um, First Minister's meetings, the new tradition that has just emerged is that representatives from the leading national level Indigenous bodies, which are again contested, and I'm happy to chat offline about this if you wish, um, but they meet separately with the Prime Minister before the formal meetings start. And this is, uh, we'll, we'll see what lies ahead in terms of these new traditions that are uh, emerging in the country. So, th so in, in summary, uh, what we see is bottom up dynamics, uh, top down dynamics, and also horizontal dynam dynamics, all kind of swirling around uh, through the Federation. Thank you. And they call it Canada. <laughs> Bottom up, top down, horizontal, everything's happening at once. Uh, thanks for raising the municipal and indigenous uh, nations. Um, but also, I mean, it is ad hoc and there's this varied engagement. It changes over time. It changes by issue. Um, and, and it does depend, and, and other people have raised this to some extent, on, on the personalities of the people in charge, the premiers or the prime minister. So um, we're going to turn it over to you, the audience, to ask questions. Um, I'm going to pose one more, but um, when you want to ask a question, there's a reactions button at the bottom of your screen. And when you click on it, there's something that says raise hand. And if you raise your hand, I will get them in the order that you do that. And I will let you then um, unmute and ask your question. But I'm going to ask one last question of the group um, while you're thinking up your questions and, and writing them down. And it's really about how you evaluate the results of intergovernmental cooperation. You know, we all think it's a wonderful thing, but how do we know if it's working? How do we evaluate it? And what data do we need to do that? Now, Constantina talked about that at the very beginning uh, about the public consortia and the different databases and you know he was complaining that they didn't you know they don't work together but but I'm not even sure all of the other countries that were represented here actually have even those databases so I'm going to ask you what recommendations or initiatives exist for a periodic evaluation of the results of intergovernmental cooperation in your country are there reliable databases that can be used for evaluation of intergovernmental cooperation? And Sean, I'm going to start with you again. And I, I know you said the federal government does not want to be involved in Switzerland in any of this data, but, but are there databases? Is there any evaluation of the cooperation that goes on? In short, you don't really have an authoritative database that would be compiled by the authorities. Um, what you have are, on the one hand, efforts by scholars to try and collect the data and to try and analyze, mainly really by comparing um, um, like with like. So you would have large municipalities without a cooperation in a certain sector, and you would have equally large municipalities with a cooperation in the same sector. And then you're able to compare, well, are those with the cooperation really better off uh, or another type of cooperation is before after. So before having engaged, was it cheaper? Uh, was it more expensive? And do we really see the benefits as promised by those who advocated the specific cooperation regime? So these are efforts by scholars, public administration, uh, scholars, political scientists, but also local government and, and federal scholars. And then on the other hand, you have from the side of, of, of the politicians, parliamentarians and governments, periodic and sporadic calls for evaluation of a certain treaty, uh, especially if it comes up for renewal. So parliamentarians would question the government, well, do we really need to stay in that kind of cooperation agreement? And then the government charges the administration, 
with coming up of, of some answers um, by saying, yes, the benefits are such and such to that side, such and such. And we think usually it's prolonged. Uh, so these, there's a certain past dependency in, in, in this whole intergovernmental um, quagmire. You have some 600 contracts in existence just for the cantons alone. So 600 contracts for 28 cantons. You can imagine how many contracts and cooperation regimes there are for 2,000 municipalities. Um, nobody knows really how much there is. Um, it works until it works. And when it, there are problems, then politicians and or scholars start investigating really also reactive, as Jennifer said, in the Canadian case. So the word ad hoc comes to mind again. Uh, it's sort of ad hoc research that's done from time to time as needed. You, you talked about... Um, you know, whether services are cheaper when there's a, an intermunicipal agreement. And that's the obvious thing to look at, right? Uh, if we're cooperating, can we provide these services more cheaply? Can we achieve economies of scale? Uh, that sort of thing. What, what would be some of the other measures that would be used besides the cost of services? You talked about benefits, but what, what would those be? Yeah, quality and um, whatever that means. So quality can mean um, speed of accessibility, can mean the degree of professionalism of a certain service that is, that is rendered to you. So one of the few initiatives from the federal government to standardize sort of cooperation in a specific area was in the area of, of child care. Uh, so when, when the parents are no longer able to care for their child, there's a specific term, tutelage, I think it's in, in French. Um, so when the authorities have to step in and take over, um, there was a sort of effort to standardize that and it became much more expensive because now you would have to have lawyers with a certain qualification, you would have to have a certain caseload per year to be able to form this intergovernmental arrangement. And people said it became more expensive, but it became better, uh, more neutral, um, uh, more professional, um, but also more complicated and it would take longer to actually reach a decision than before when you had just the mayor of a municipality deciding to take that child out of the family or not. Okay, good, thank you. Um, I encourage people to raise your hand and um, get recognized to ask a question. Uh, you've, you've got four excellent panelists here, plus our two Brazilian speakers at the beginning. So please, uh, um, ask questions. Um, I'll go to Reka next on, on the data and evaluation question. Are you muted? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I think as I mentioned, uh, like there have been uh, constant review of central state relations and uh, even during one party dominance of the Congress, uh, Indira Gandhi did appoint Sarkaria Commission on the insistence of the states because there were movements all across India regarding more autonomy and therefore she appointed Sarkaria Commission to look into central state relations which came out with two volume uh, report and then uh, and it is very rich you know in information and uh, regarding past patterns and future prospects I think it is very, uh, you know, good. Uh, it's a mine of information for researchers. And for instance, it talks about how many times uh, Article 200 has been misused with regard to reservation of a provincial bill by the Governor General. Then how many times 350, Article 356 with regard to imposition of emergency by the President has been misused. And about the role of Governor, it talks about how, you know, uh, what should be uh, the ideal situation or posi uh, positioning that the governor should take. So, so, and then another commission which was set up in um, by BJP led, uh, Bharatiya Janata Party led NDA government in 1999 uh, to review the entire constitution. And there is a chapter devoted to center state relations where they do talk about strengthening, especially institutions of uh, center state cooperation, especially interstate council, which was not set up, though it's a constitutional body in Article 263 of the Constitution. But it was only set up when uh, India moved from one party dominance to multi party system. And since it was set up in 1990, 
you know, only 12 meetings have taken place so far, to my knowledge, and uh, it has not been an active forum. Uh, so, and then uh, the last commission on center state relations was MM Panchi Commission, uh, which was set up by Congress, led UP government in 2010. So I think we have rich uh, data uh, set, and besides that, we have finance commission reports, parliamentary debates, and as pointed out by other uh, panelists, like scholars and research institutes, which are working in uh, on these data sets. And uh, there are two important centers for federal studies in India, Center for Multilevel Federalism. I'm also honorary vice chairperson of the center and Center for Federal Studies. So they are doing some kind of study. Yeah. So. This is what I have to say. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it, it's in India, it's more the case of commissions that are struck from time to time that, that evaluate. Uh, can I just mention one more point? Like sure. case, case laws. Case laws are also very important. Uh, like SR Bombay case with regard to president's rule that reverted its earlier judgment, you know, regarding imposition of president's rule. So various case laws have also been very important source of data set in India. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Miguel, how about in Argentina? Yes, uh, um, again, the central government, the, the federal government uh, plays a, a big role here uh, because of the uh, uh, organization of the ministries in the federal level. For example, the Ministry of the Interior owns two uh, under secretaries one for municipalities and the other for uh, provinces. So it's a, a natural uh, function of these uh, undersecretaries to collect data about the, um, uh, the uh, jurisdictions, provincial or municipal ones. And uh, uh, it is an instrument, not perfect of course, but it is an instrument for joining information about the uh, the second level of the federation and about the third level of the federation. Uh, it's particularly curious, this uh, type of uh, um, organization. Of course, it's, uh, it's clear, uh, it's apparently clear, but in the origin of uh, the, uh, the, the creation of the federation in the year 1953, uh, 1853, pardon, uh, uh, the system was uh, one of separation, was a dual logic of federation uh, in the line of uh, the United States, for example. Um, so the, the question could be, uh, why uh, under secretary for municipalities where the uh, speakers in the dialogue in the 19th century were only the federal government and the provincial governments. But uh, progressively, a long time, like in other uh, countries, I imagine, uh, it was necessary to, uh, to have some time of uh, uh, minimal information in the federal level uh, for the uh, relation, not only with uh, uh, provinces, but also in a certain sense with municipalities. So the, the federal ministry uh, at present has two uh, under secretaries, one for uh, provinces and, and one for municipalities. In the end, uh, anyway, in the end, the autonomy of the, uh, the municipalities is an autonomy uh, which must be ruled in the provincial constitution. So uh, it's an autonomy regulated by the provincial constitutions. Uh, uh, in the end, again, uh, in my very modest uh, view, the main actors in the federal relationship continue being the federal government and the provinces. This is uh, one observation. In the other way, uh, uh, in a uh, world of federal councils, in a world of executive federalism in my country, uh, the federal councils uh, join uh, or collect uh, very important information about different issues. For example, 
uh, I've been speaking about the environment or about uh, uh, public health or about education. Uh, this is a form for uh, having some more fruitful um, design for public policies, uh, seeing each other, the provinces, or seeing each other, some uh, big municipalities, at least. But uh, I don't know if there exists some uh, uh, integral, uh, consolidated system for uh, joining all the information, all the information about the cooperation uh, agreements or the functioning of the multilateral cooperation in my country. I think that we have information, but uh, I, I can't affirm that this, this is a consolidated and complete information. Okay, thank you. So you, you talked about the federal councils collecting information, you talked about the Minister of the Interior collecting information, but it's not necessarily about intergovernmental cooperation agreements and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a range of, of data on, on different topics, I would think. Um, going to Canada, and I, there are a couple of questions in the chat, and um, I will get to them, but if people who put them in the chat want to ask them themselves, I, I will turn to them, but first to Jennifer. Hey, thank you. Um, so hopefully my internet remains stable right now. It's a bit uh, acting up because uh, I also am more than willing to share my speaking notes uh, from beforehand if people would like to have them to throw it through a translator. Um, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, in terms of the evaluation of agreements, uh, there is a an assessment of the government. You are breaking up on us, Jennifer. Uh, there is very <laughs> Jennifer, can I suggest you turn off your you camera? Me? Why don't you turn off your camera? It might help yeah. your internet. Yes, there. Hopefully that's a bit better. Yes, thank you. Good. Um, so in there are no systematic in part because intergovernmental agreements are not legally enforceable or binding. And so there is no kind of mandatory reporting on results. So for instance, the federal government transfers quite a significant amount of money dedicated to healthcare uh, to the provinces. However, there is no forced reporting of results of improved, say, uh, weight levels of improved diet. Instead of you're, break, you're breaking up again. Um, I, so I, I think what you've tried to say, there's no systematic evaluation of, of intergovernmental agreements because they're not legally enforceable or binding. Uh, and you, you're talking about health care right. and how the federal government gives a lot of money to the provinces for health care, but there isn't any evaluation of how that money is spent like have wait times being reduced in hospitals, that sort of thing. Is that what you've said so far? I think, I think we can't hear you, Jennifer. That that will help. Um, maybe if we could return to me in two minutes or so, or in a bit, uh, that would sure. be Sure, okay. Um, so uh, we have we have something in the chat, a comment from Alexandris. Do you want to, I see you're, you're on screen. Do you want to talk about this intergovernmental agreement in, in Brazil? Could you unmute please and join us? You need to unmute. Uh, 
Oh, yes, yeah, sí. Please go ahead. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I can, read, oops, I can read it out. Um, uh, good morning. Uh, we have an interinstitutional cooperation agreement in which we work on fiscal policies of common interest. That is, we integrate 12 municipalities, which represent 22% of the GDP of the state of Ceará in Brazil. In this agreement, we discuss and share local tax policies, such as instruments to improve collection, tax administration measures, compliance, tax education and citizenship, participatory budgeting, government accounting. Regarding the international experiences studied here, how has this side of cooperation that deals with public finance and tax administration been working? So to our panel, uh, can you talk about any intergovernmental agreements among local authorities that deal with tax administration? And, and I'm wondering if, uh, Alexandra, I guess you, you can't, join us, but I'm wondering if, if the tax collection is done together or is it just agreements on how to do it? But I wonder if, if in Switzerland, Argentina, India, Canada, we could talk about... Uh, Miguel, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Speaking about the um, collection agreement, um, I think I missed to mention the uh, in the um, horizontal level uh, some um, mechanism for collecting the uh, main uh, tax, uh, which is a tax on uh, on uh, gross income, like to say on uh, sales, uh, located in the level of the provinces. So in this case. Um, there exists some institution called multilateral agreement. So uh, this this multilateral agreement uh, uh, permits that uh, periodically the fiscal authorities and the fiscal representatives from the different provinces join um, and uh, establish. Uh, indicators and coefficients for distributing in uh, equal equal basis the uh, the product for uh, the revenue in this uh, tax. So this uh, multilateral multilateral agreement is an instrument in the horizontal level the collection of uh, the main tax in the provincial level. In the federal, in the federal level, of course, exists the uh, Comisión Federal de Impuestos in Spanish. Uh, is uh, something like a national a federal uh, tax commission for taxation, uh, which uh, receives the uh, declines for the uh, provincial governments and uh, from other actors, maybe uh, particular actors, about the functioning and the operation of the system of revenue sharing in the country. So we have two main commissions, the, the, the Federal Tax Commission uh, or, or the Federal Commission for, for National Taxes in the uh, vertical relation uh, between the nation and provinces, and then the multilateral, multilateral agreement commission for the uh, administration and collection uh, of the sales tax in the provinces. This is, uh, uh, this is a, uh, they are mechanisms for the uh, uh, fiscal functioning of the uh, system in the main taxes in, in, in Argentina. So in, in the other fields, as I, told, as I tell you, 
the federal councils uh, refer only to particular matters. Uh, so the information uh, and, the, and the data collected by them is connected with particular issues. Education, health, environment, uh, uh, social security also. Uh, there is a, a lot of federal councils. Um, mainly uh, with the information and the connection among uh, provincial ministers with national ministers or federal ministers. This is the connection. And the, in this way, the executive federalism uh, gives a dynamic to the cooperation that is not considered explicitly, explicitly in the origin of the federation in the 19th century. The federal council were uh, created along decades uh, from the 19th century to the present. But at present, federal council, I think, are the, 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 the mechanism for giving dynamic to the uh, um, multi-level cooperation in the country. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so in answer to the tax, uh, you, the tax question, you said that they do have a federal tax commission and multilateral um agreements for tax collection and, and then you talked a bit more about the federal councils which sound very much like what jennifer was talking about in canada jennifer has her hand up i'm going to go to her in one minute but sean muller has to leave us and so i'm just going to turn to you sean uh for some last comments before you leave yeah thank you unfortunately i have child care duties so i need to then go but just wanted to jump in on that aspect and say um there is a lot of informal cooperation going on in Switzerland in the form of associations of tax collectors from the 26 governments or the association of chief medical doctors of the 26 cantons. So nobody knows exactly how many of these associations there are, but obviously these are important venues to engage in this kind of mutual learning um, benchmarking, not in a formal way with a law that stipulates the criteria, but simply by meeting, as we would also do as, as colleagues on a conference, keeping up, creating trust, engaging and learning from each other. So this whole informal aside takes place and is very important to cover this really the, the idea of federalism as, a, as an experiment, as a lab. Well, it only works if people are aware of the different experiments, both the ones that work and the ones that have failed. We tend to speak only of the experiments that worked, but the experiments that have failed in terms of tax collection or garbage collection or recycling or whatever the specific task are equally, if not even more important. So we can avoid doing the same mistake twice or thrice or 26 times or 2000 times in the different communes. I'm sorry I have to go. I would love to continue discussing for the rest of the day. Thank you very much to everybody for organizing and I hope to see you soon at some point in life and not just on Zoom. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Sean. Um, and I'm going to uh, turn back to Jennifer now. Uh, thanks very much and I'll keep turning off my video uh, in the hopes that that improves my internet. Um, tax collection is actually one area where there has been quite remarkable um, coordination between the federal and provincial governments in many aspects. Specifically, the federal government, through an, a major intergovernmental agreement, uh, acts as the primary tax collector on behalf of the provinces uh, through the Canada Revenue Agency. The one exception to this, of course, is found in the province of Quebec that has retained its own separate and independent Revenue Quebec uh, collection agency. And so at least in this respect, it's kind of eased the burden on citizens because we can file um, a kind of singular uniform kind of tax collection, uh, I forget exactly when this occurs every year, but it's kind of simplified and streamlined our process in terms of uh, tax collection. Uh, the same goes in terms of uh, harmonization of pension arrangements. 
which, and again, Quebec is the exception to this, but that's kind of stabilized certain aspects of the fiscal regime in terms of the uh, revenue raising side of the equation. What we also saw, uh, one area of great cooperation, in fact, and Enid would be able to speak uh, in greater detail uh, to this, is the gas tax agreement that was secured to allocate money from the federal uh, revenues on gas tax to municipalities directly. Although here again, we see contested arrangements. So for instance, my understanding is in the province of Manitoba, uh, cities have been saying that the province has not been giving the money that has been raised through that that is supposed to be their allocation. So again, here, once again, we see this theme of ad hoc and lack of sufficient oversight to ensure that what governments are claiming they're doing is actually happening on the ground. Uh, so I just wanted to raise those, those few points in terms of the, uh, the tax regime in Canada. Great, thank you. And you came through uh, very clearly, so thank you very much. Um, I will talk about the gas tax, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for, for questions or raised hands. Uh, you've got these experts here that you can ask. Um, if any of the Brazilians who are on the line want to follow up with any of the speakers or ask any questions, uh, please raise your hand and I will recognize you. Uh, the gas tax transfer in Canada is a really interesting one because uh, municipalities have always asked the federal government for money and the provinces have always stood in the way because in our constitution um, it, it states very clearly that local institutions and that includes municipal governments are the responsibility of the provinces um, but over the years federal governments i mean they can give money to anyone they want so they can give money to municipalities if they choose and they chose this gas tax vehicle but in fact, it's, it's, not, it's been renamed, and I can't remember the new name offhand, but it's not related to gas tax revenues at all. Uh, it's actually, it started at $2 billion a year, adjusted every year by inflation. And there was some relationship to federal gas tax revenues at the beginning, but there's no relationship to those revenues now. It's, it's really just a transfer uh, from the federal government. Um, any other, any, um, Rekha, please. Yeah. Uh, I just want to respond to one, your question that you mentioned earlier about local government, you know, so because I could not answer that. And so I think as far as I mentioned that the local government got constitutional footing only in 1993 by 73rd and 74th Constitutional Act. So I would say their role is more revolutionary than federal in the sense that states had to pass conforming act you know to implement them and in different states you know and 20 under it, uh, this amendment 29 subjects were transferred to uh, local uh, panchayats and 20, 18 to municipalities so in different states you know uh, they have uh, you know transferred subjects but in some states they have transferred all the 29 subjects in some they have transferred less subjects, some they have transferred more subjects, so there are wide variations. So its role is more devolutionary, I would say, than federal. And, and there's been demand for, uh, you know, uh, transferring more funds, more functionaries, more functions to local governments to really strengthen them. And therefore, um, you know, as far as IGR are concerned, I think there have been some meetings of the mayors, or sarpanches, but I would say it's a non-starter. Non Thank you so much. Okay, so I have a question in the chat uh, from Monica. Uh, in Brazil, subnational governments play an important role in financing state investment. Often there is little technical capacity, which is partly solved with vertical cooperation between states and municipalities, or with the exchange of information. Oh, I just lost it or the exchange of information between states, horizontal cooperation. There are difficulties, however, in establishing a strategic investment agenda. Does the central government have a development agenda that functions as a benchmark for subnational governments to invest in and as a coordination mechanism? So I, I throw it out to any one of our panelists. Does the central government in your country have a development agenda 
that functions as a benchmark for subnational governments to invest in and as a coordination mechanism. So is there a context in which municipalities, local governments uh, can invest? Miguel? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure to, uh, to have the possibility of answering uh, exactly which is uh, asking uh, Monica and other people. But uh, uh, I want to add that the, um, in the constitutional regime in Argentina, uh, the in interprovincial treaty, so uh, treaties in the level of the provinces are particularly important for uh, some of uh, uh, activities of cooperation. So uh, uh, the uh, agreements among municipalities and association of municipalities are also possible. But uh, in the field of uh, provincial treaty, uh, there is a lot of examples of uh, many uh, uh, achievements. For example, the, the big uh, tunnel uh, uh, across the Parana River um, between the provinces of Santa Fe and Santa Rios, uh, which is a, 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 a very big public work, was developed by an interprovincial treaty, not with uh, a, a, a decision of the federal government, but with an interprovincial treaty. This was an, an, an example for uh, uh, treaties. In, in terms of uh, public work, for example. Uh, and uh, the interprovincial treaties are the, the, the mechanism in the base of the creation of regions now. When we think about the, the, the Patagonia region and the uh, uh, governing council of the Patagonia region and with the assembly of the Patagonia region, or in the case of the uh, central region, the assembly, uh, and then the, uh, the board for governing this type of uh, uh, organization, we are speaking also in the end about interprovincial treaty. So uh, it is a very uh, interesting mechanism that uh, I think the, uh, that uh, uh, many federations could be uh, they use uh, in practice. Uh, but uh, frequently, the, uh, the obstacle for the functioning of these agreements is, uh, as early always, uh, the financial one. And sometimes uh, when the, the, the province is signing the, the agreement uh, has, has not money, has not money, they must add money to the federal governments again. <laughs> so now appears one of the uh, uh, very uh, uh, important issues uh, in the functioning of uh, the, federation, the federation in Argentina, that is the spending power. Who owns the spending power in, in Argentina? Well, I think that in uh, most federations, uh, the big brother. <laughs> Who is the big brother? The big, the big brother is the federal government. Uh, and then uh, when it's necessary more money, the money uh, frequently comes from the federal government. So the spending power uh, not only can uh, help to provincial dynamic and interprovincial treaties, but uh, also can be coercive. Uh, I remember the, uh, the, the, the contribution, for example, uh, like authors uh, uh, as John Kincaid in the United States or uh, again, Richard Bird or, or, or uh, in Canada, uh, it is, it's clear that the coercive power, it is possible to be used when the federal government owns a big spending power. Uh, I think that the spending power is a, a crucial issue 
in the multilevel cooperation in vertical sense, but also in the horizontal sense. Well, I think you're certainly right about that. Um, and, uh, you know, the same is true in Canada. The federal government has a lot of money. Uh, the provinces and municipalities, as Jennifer said, had, you know, have all the responsibilities. And how does the federal government use that money? Is, do they use that coercive power, as you've referred to it, uh, to get the provinces to do things? And uh, Jennifer has her hand up, and I'm going to turn to her next. But, but I think the federal government in Canada has not done that so much. Uh, in the past. And, and your comment on interprovincial treaties is also really interesting, you know, the cooperation that comes with uh, those treaties. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, uh, the, it's a fascinating question, actually. And what I realized in thinking it through is in Canada, we've seen also a shift from uh, a tradition of trying to have intergovernmental agreements that transcended all or engaged all provinces to a tradition now uh, since the late 90s, early 2000s of increasing bilateral agreements. So between the federal government and a specific province, and then in turn, trilateral, trilateral agreements between the federal government, the provincial government, and a specific municipality. Uh, this has been really used in an effort to try and improve public transportation systems specifically. Um, and right away, I'm thinking of Sean talking about how, you know, you make the same mistake over and over and over again. And, and we've certainly seen evidence of this, but that would be the one example where you see uh, the federal government and the province is creating space where the municipalities need to also put in money into the game. Uh, in order to, let's say, build a new um, uh, terrible, in the case of Ottawa, a uh, light rapid transit, right? Um, uh, that uh, is a public-private partnership that really has had questionable success, shall we say, for those of us living in this city. Um, so that would be kind of one example that I would, would think of, um, that this sort of effort by the federal government to try and encourage the municipalities to invest in a certain area. But again, you have this kind of tension of how the extent to which the provinces themselves are willing to engage in this sort of uh, type of trilateral arrangement. Thank you. So I have one more question in the chat uh, from Eduardo, and I think I'm going to make this the last question. Um, in some federations, such as Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, and the USA, in the past years have started a recentralization process, perhaps a coercive one. This process has changed the balance of power in intergovernmental relations in favor of the federal government. I want to know what you think about this process, so this process of recentralization. What could be the reasons behind this modification affecting decentralization or subnational autonomy? What are the main relevant instruments to preserve federal safeguards considering this power shifting in favor of the central government? Um, Reka, are you there? Do you want to try and answer this one for India? Well, uh, maybe we'll come back to Reka. How about to Miguel? Oh. Uh, thank you, Inid. Uh, can I speak or we must wait for Rika? No, go ahead, please. Ah, okay. Um, well, very, very interesting. Uh, it's clear that people who is asking about this <laughs> is people who know very profoundly <laughs> some some of the processes of digitalization in our countries really is necessary to, to admit and to accept that uh, frequently decentralization comes uh, from the hands of fiscal restriction in the central government. So central government sometimes uh, has uh, renounced it, uh, uh, has uh, quit from his responsibility some activities because of fiscal reasons. Uh, 
and uh, this is a very long story in, in, in Argentina, uh, which, uh, which means that, uh, for example, in education, uh, this uh, movement uh, began in the, in the 70s, in the last century, and was reinforced in the 90s, also in the, in the last century. Um, in this moment, the, the, uh, uh, for the provision, remembering the very uh, useful differentiation, like our uh, big expert Anwar Shah <laughs> uh, clarifies the difference between regulation and provision. Frequently, the federal government tries to maintain some kind of regulation, but the provision, uh, the delivery of the services, uh, uh, was uh, 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 put it in the hands of the of the provinces. Uh, this was the the, the particular uh, wave in the in the 70s and in, in the 90s, and in this moment the only provision for education in Argentina is in the level of the university, that to say the post-secondary education uh, uh, in the uh, university level. The provinces in this moment are delivering the primary, uh, the pre-primary education, primary education and uh, uh, secondary education and including post-secondary education but not uh, of university nature. It's a particular category of education, but uh, it is uh, something like uh, 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 an improvement of the secondary education, the post-secondary in the hands of provinces. Uh, uh, university education is in the, in, in the field of provision, of course, I, I speaking, uh, is in the hands of the federal government. In, in the in the field of health, uh, the the role of the provinces in this moment is uh, is is enormous, but usually uh, there is a, a general regulating in the uh, in the basic and uh, essential standards in the hands of the federal government, but the provision. Uh, mainly and um, predominantly are in the hands of, of provinces. Uh, so the, 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 the question uh, uh, that I'm trying to, to, to answer is that really the centralization exists, is uh, uh, important in this moment in the field of spending and in the field of provision or the delivery of services, but it's not important in the field of revenues. The main revenues are in the hands of the uh, federal government. That to say, uh, uh, income tax, personal income tax, corporate income tax, uh, value added tax, the, 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 these both, the, the main sale tax and the main uh, income tax are in the hands of the of the federal government. So decentralization in the uh, side of uh, uh, expenditures of functions and centralization in the field of revenue. It is the the present functioning of uh, of our federation. Uh, thank you. I, I'm sorry if I'm not <laughs> answering. Uh, uh, correctly your uh, uh no i think that's i think that's fine thank you i mean uh, you know the the responsibilities remain at the provincial level and the money remains at the federal level um Reka, i don't know if you had a chance to see this question but it, it's, uh, no. okay uh, okay so i think it's uh you know uh difficult to give a straight answer but uh, to my knowledge i think i'll try uh, I think as, uh, in my opinion, uh, it is uh, mainly because of the party system. Once, like, again, you know, uh, things are changing in India and hopefully in future, maybe we'll again have multi-party coalition government, maybe next elections, I hope so. 
then the balance of power will again shift and states will play a prominent role so and they and as i said they have become more uh, you know assertive with the great uh, in their of privatization and globalization and they are directly negotiating with foreign capital and uh, you know on one hand there's pressure for integrating national economy with global economy and then it's a spin off effect is also making state governments more autonomous because there's also pressure within the nation to decentralize power to the grassroots level and therefore we saw you know the strengthening of the uh, local governments uh, that got constitutional footing so uh, and then similarly intergovernmental relations also i think uh, that will also change if, when state governments will become more powerful uh, because once uh, party system as i said is the most the context that is more important that uh, once it changes you know, the federal features will become more prominent uh, in multi party coalition phase and i think civil society can also play an important role by creating a pressure you know uh you know to uh, on institutions yes excellent <laughs> point we haven't talked about civil society today and that's an ex uh, an excellent point about uh when we're doing uh, cooperation one, that we're including civil society in that cooperation as uh, well and i think courts have also played a very important role in india as i mentioned about sr bomai judgment and uh, various case laws uh, like keshu ananda bhati judgment minerva mills court judgment with regard to the basic structure basic structure of the constitution that cannot be destroyed and the uh, 1973 case as a state of kerala versus keshu ananda bhati case which talked about laid down the foundation of the basic structure debate in india and the last and a very important uh, you know case recently was Uh, advocates on record was uh, case in 2nd uh, in 2015 that talked about judicial independence that that is also with regard to, to setting up of national judicial commission uh, that judicial independence is also one of the basic features of the constitution that cannot be you know destroyed thank you thank you uh, last word quickly to jennifer and then we'll sum up um so i was the general dynamic in canada has been resistance to centralization uh in the sense that uh provinces uh, and increasingly territories are quite autonomous and independent and very successfully push back on efforts by the federal government to try and intrude in areas of provincial jurisdiction so for instance in canada in contrast to such federations as australia or the united states there has been no centralization of power or authority in the area of education um this is just not something that has happened here for a variety of reasons uh which i would be happy to explore um similarly we see resistance when the federal government for instance is trying to now intervene in areas of public housing uh and even though the provinces want the more money because we're back at this this theme of of who has the purse strings uh the provinces want more funding but they don't want federal uh restrictions or coercive mechanisms or national standards or whatever you want to whatever term you want to apply uh and so for the most part because federal governments and federal political parties want to get reelected they are very reticent to make moves that will be regarded as incursions in provincial jurisdictions that can be used and mobilized by um either uh, opposition parties at the provincial level uh and and kind of campaign initiatives uh and on I'll just end in terms of the civil society point this is certainly a a real problem in the canadian uh landscape intergovernmental landscape is the exclusion and the marginalization of civil society within these conversations thank you Thank you and that is a topic for another webinar I think uh for sure. So before I turn it back over to Fernando um thank you to the panelists excellent conversation. Uh we've talked about um bottom up cooperation, top down, sideways, uh largely informal. A lot of the cooperation you heard about was informal. Um and in the context that we talked about was one of in particularly in Switzerland of of local autonomy um 
and, and to some extent in Canada, the constitution is very important, personalities, party systems. So, you know, whenever we're looking at other countries, and I, I look at the Brazilians on this webinar, you know, you have to look at the context in which each of these uh, panelists was talking and, and, you know, the constitution of that country and, and, and uh, the importance of local autonomy or less so. Um, I, I think, I, I know um, when Constantino talked at the beginning, he was very interested in data and evaluation. And, you know, there's not much out there. I mean, we've heard that there are some scholars who do this, but that's not on a, you know, an annual systematic basis. We've heard about commissions that are set up every now and again to evaluate the system, but there isn't a lot of data and, and there's not a lot of, um, I would say, um, systematic evaluation of how that cooperation works. Um, I, I think um, Sean has left, but he said federalism is an experiment, it's a lab, and we have to keep evaluating these mechanisms um, to see what works, but also what doesn't work. So again, thank you to the panelists, and I will turn it back over to Fernando for final comments. Well, thank you. We, thank you. We need to thank to all the participants in these events. Uh, let me just say uh, very rapidly, uh, as I said at the beginning, there is not a model that fits all in federal countries. No? Each federation is a result of its history, its culture, its origins, and, uh, and so, on. so on. And some of these facts reflect in important points that were raised by the participants in this seminar. For instance, the influence of political parties and the political relations in federal arrangements. Uh, the conflict among national priorities and local interests and needs in some cases. Uh, the, uh, the evolving nature of uh, federal intergovernment relation, as was pointed out, I guess, by RECA and, and, and others. Uh, and the impact of what is happening in the world, the globalization of economic activities, adoption of new technologies in, uh, in economic production and uh, distribution of goods and services, and how this as some authors point out, impact on uh, international and inter-country disparities. So, so there is a lot of issues that we have to deal with in the nearby uh, future. Uh, so uh, what I think, so first of all, there is no the possibility of each one trying to uh, adopt what any federations country did to deal with these issues. Uh, what we, we have, or at least what I think we have to do, is to collect fragments of each particular case, put them on the table, and try to look at what this picture, the collection of fragments, tell us uh, to reflect on our particular case. This is what we intend to do here. Uh, what different situations manage to deal with the situation? Uh, how we should reflect on the at position each case adopts to deal with these issues and uh, how this reflection might help us to uh, go ahead in improving intergovernmental relations in Brazil. And uh, to that end, I think that uh, all the contributions in this event was very important. And uh, I would like again uh, to thank everyone who has been here in this uh, virtual room, to thank Enid for his important moderation of this uh, seminar and the organizers in the figures of Diana Shevanova and Lian. Uh, to uh, help us organize this event. So that's what I have to say uh, in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando. And I would just like to add before we close that um, we are keeping track of the questions in the chat. 
And so if there are some questions we didn't get to, we can do that tomorrow. So I just want to let you know your questions are not lost. We will get back to them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just uh, I'll just uh, <clears throat> uh, let me just try a few few uh, last comments. Uh, I'll just re reiterate the thanks to everybody uh, in it for great moderation, uh, all our panelists for a you know a great contributions and the time they dedicated to to us to this webinar. Uh, also, I wanted to thank our well Liam again because you know his support is invaluable and uh, uh, my colleagues Asma, Zribi, and our summer students and um, and interns who are providing support uh, on the background. Um, also Fernando Constantino, uh, we put together this this program and uh, uh, IPA communications department. And uh, last but not least, the interpreters who are. Uh, making sure that um, um, everybody <clears throat> can can understand what we are speaking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, lastly, just a reminder that uh, that tomorrow we will reconvene at uh, 9 a.m. Um, uh, uh, Canadian time and uh, 10 a.m. Brazilian time. And we are looking at the uh, four remaining uh, cases, uh, which are <clears throat> South Africa, Germany, Mexico, and Colombia. So we hope to see you tomorrow and uh, we wish everybody a um, good rest of the day and uh, yeah, looking forward to, to a webinar tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>